Good evening and welcome to the March 30th, 2021 Gilderland Central School District Board of Education meeting. Would you all please silence your cell phones and recite the pledge? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so first on the agenda tonight, we have two public comments. First public comment is from Melinda Person. And she writes, I am writing as a parent of two students currently attending school remotely, second grade, and the parent of a soon to be kindergartner this fall at GES. In recent communications from the school, we were advised that the district is planning a typical school year without remote instruction, presumably assuming state guidelines will change and allow for increased occupancy. My request is that the Gilderland schools include a comprehensive COVID testing program in our safety plan by the beginning of the next school year. As a parent and former educator, I know and believe strongly that the best environment for students to learn and grow is via in-person instruction. There is no substitute for the direct engagement between an educator and a child. However, I also strongly believe that a return to full in-person instruction must be accompanied by proper health and safety protocols in place that will protect our students and the people who serve them. We simply cannot afford to get it wrong. It is great that we have had and continue to have success rolling out vaccinations for school employees. Additionally, the low infection rates in our schools is a testament to the commitment Gilderland has made to wearing masks, social distancing and proper disinfection and hygiene strategies. All of this is to be commended and celebrated but the risk posed by COVID still exists. There are still staff who have not been vaccinated and most notably, none of our students have been vaccinated. We have yet to reach herd immunity as vaccinations continue and we are now faced with new strains that threaten to undo our hard work. Further, we still do not know what the long-term effects are upon children if they contract the virus. All of this is to say that we are, we are at a critical point the B117 variant, first detected in the United Kingdom, has begun infecting people in the United States and is predicted to be the dom dominant strain of SARS-CoV-2 in the United States by the end of March. This variant is more transmissible and may be infecting young people and children at a higher rate than earlier strains did. New York also just had its first case of the Brazilian coronavirus variant, one of a number of rapidly evolving versions of the virus. According to the CDC, a study completed by the Rockefeller Foundation, COVID testing works as a mitigation strategy. The Rockefeller Foundation found that school-based screening programs reduce in-school infections and spread. They also conclude that universal testing programs increase student and parent confidence as they prepare for returning to school, to, to in-school, sorry, in-person learning. Much of this additional confidence comes from knowing that with testing, the silent spread of COVID is being stopped in its tracks. It is people who have been infected yet show no symptoms that can pose such a threat to our school communities. What's more, the federal government has provided resources to deploy multiple strategies to achieve a safe return to in-person instruction for all students. For COVID testing, specifically the federal government through the American Rescue Plan allocates 335 million for New York State schools to be used for COVID testing efforts. Now it is the time to prioritize this crucial protective measure. I am confident we can return all students to in-person instruction safely if we are willing to take the necessary steps required to do so. Sincerely, Melinda Person. The next public comment is from Nancy Clum Dolan. She writes, my teaching career in Gilderland was at Farnsworth Middle School, and I was very lucky to work there for 30 years. I'm concerned about the school day schedule proposed for future school years. One of my concerns is the transition of sixth grade students. It will be a long afternoon for students who traditionally were dismissed much earlier from the elementary schools. As a sixth grade teacher, I witnessed students who were fatigued in the afternoon keeping students until 4.20 for an activity period and then putting them on a long bus ride is concerning to me as a teacher and a parent. Also, many students participate in extracurricular activities. 
I am concerned about student health when they are required to stay at school until 345, participate in extracurricular activities, eat dinner, keep up with their assignments and spend time with their families. It's a very full day for young middle school students. Another concern is about the student athletes who need to leave school early to participate in sports. It was a constant concern in previous years and this schedule exacerbates the problem. Half of all games in a modified season are away games requiring travel and with a 4 p.m. start time over the years, there were frequent discussions about how much student athletes were missing in school due to the late dismissal at FMS. Moving forward to make the end of the day even later, will continue to stress the student athletes, their parents and their teachers. During the pandemic and while teaching from home, I was very aware of this time students were working on their computers. We were often reminded that students needed time to recharge their mental, emotional and physical batteries. I'm asking that you reconsider the FMS schedule and consider the daily lives of our FMS students and its impact on students and families. Thank you, Nancy Clum Dolan, retired FMS teacher. Okay, I think we are talking about the um, schedule later tonight in the presentation, correct Dr. Wiles? And then the public comment about um, the testing and vaccines, that will be an ongoing, I think, conversation. So unless anyone else has anything to add, we can move on to the next item. No? Okay. Um, next, we have uh, the personnel agenda. Um, this is under agenda items, letter A. Um, can I have a motion to approve this personnel agenda? Gloria, second Barb, any questions? All in favor? Aye. Passes 9-0. Thank you. And finally, we have budget development, and I will turn this over to Dr. Wiles. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Let me um, just talk a little bit about our process for tonight. The bulk of our work on the budget tonight is really responding to the questions that were raised through the thought exchange that closed at four o'clock this afternoon. Um, so I have asked some of our leadership team to join us to assist with that. So uh, joining us tonight is Mr. Michael Piscatelli from the high school, Mr. Michael Laster from the middle school, and Mr. Dr. Alan Lockwood from the elementary, um, representing the elementary buildings. Um, and also the district office team is here. So. We're going to uh, try to work our way through the categories of questions as they came through. A thought exchange uh, does a nice job of putting them into categories for us. So we're going to start with the topics that are more strictly budget related. And then there's a ton of comments and, uh, and some questions about the school start time piece. And we'll, we'll do that kind of second. Um, obviously, uh, board members, you're welcome to follow up with any questions that you have as we're on a particular topic. Um, and, you know, obviously throughout the evening, any additional questions you might have. The last part of the budget development process is the budget worksheet that uh, Mr. Sanders sent to everyone on Friday. That's a one page kind of 30,000 foot summary of where we are right now. Um, because we don't have a state budget settled at this point, we're, we're in no different financial position today than we were one week ago when we presented the first draft of the budget. Um, but that will be our ongoing tool for any uh, potential changes that might occur between now and April 13th, which is the, um, the night which the board will adopt the budget. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, I want to start kind of uh, picking up where we left off on Tuesday, actually with a question that um, Kelly Person had about the um, federal stimulus money and you know where where is it within the budget presentation that we had? And it made me start thinking a lot about the executive budget and um, the interface between the executive budget, the federal stimulus that's built into that, plus this additional federal stimulus. So I have a, a couple slides I just want to show you to kind of um, refresh your memory. So I'm going to pull those up in a second here, I hope. Okay. 
Um, this slide is one from our presentation last Tuesday night. And um, I want to call attention to the about two thirds or more than almost halfway down the line that's called the local funding adjustment. And it's a negative $4,098,557. Um, in the governor's Budget. This is the adjustment that he is making uh, or suggesting that be made to help mitigate the gap we have at the state level. Um, if you go down three lines more, you see that a little bit more than that four million ninety-eight is offset by the COVID nineteen supplemental stimulus. That is not the money that has most recently been approved through the um, relief package that President Biden just signed. This is previous funding. So I, what I'd like to underscore here is kind of the question of, so what happens when that COVID-19 stimulus money goes away? Because right now, the, the executive budget depends on that money to fill for us more than a $4 million hole in our budget. And the understanding that I have about that part of the governor's proposal is that it is not a one-time reduction, but that it's recurring. So what happens when that goes away? Um, you hear everyone talking about the funding cliff. So this is what it means for us here in Gilderland, should this not change. So um, we are quote unquote set for 21-22 because that $44.6 million is embedded in our state aid package. But if it's not there in the following year, 22-23, we're going to have that revenue shortfall in that, in that year, which could be compounded if you go out a second year to double to $9,250,908. Um, some of my colleagues over in the BOCES calculated these um, this impact for all 24 of the school districts in the capital region BOCES, and then made an estimation of, should that cliff not be repaired, how many FTEs would that equal? And for us, it's 139 FTEs. I share this because it just feels so much like the conversations we had, and I did reference this last Tuesday, following the last terrible um, financial crisis in the country in New York State, where we had um, a big gap. It was filled by what we called era money at the time. Then era money went away, and we got the gap elimination adjustment and it, it cost us 229 positions. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible time. So I, I wanted to underscore that. All of this is still under the development and the work of the state budget and it's tons of uncertainty, but I wanted to show that picture and contrast it with the $2.5 million that we have just been promised in the um, American Rescue Plan Act which on the face of it seems like a lot of money until you compare it with the potential gaps we have going forward if those are not um, erased in some kind of a way. So I, I wanted to give this somewhat dramatic image um, be, because there is quite a bit of uncertainty about what's going forward. We received a lot of questions in our thought exchange about why we're not adding more positions, whether it's reading teachers or social workers or te um, te teaching assistants or, you know, you name the position. And the reason why we strove to maintain rather than add is because of this um, reality, whether or not it pans out like this, of course, remains to be seen. But this is a bit of the context of, of what we're working on. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to transition now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, if that's OK. Um, I'm going to transition now to um, some of the questions that came in through the thought exchange. And I'm going to start kind of where we left off on this question about the, the rescue package. And um, 
Neil, and I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot first, if that's okay. Um, one of the questions that we got was, um, does this budget include the one we presented last week, the distribution of the American Rescue Plan Act? Um, it says 20% of the funds must be used to address learning loss, et cetera. Is it in there? And what are we going to do with the other 80% of that money um, uh, that's part of that grant? Okay. Well, thank you, Marie. Sobering introduction for sure. You're welcome. <laughs> um, well, let's just talk about the American Rescue Plan Act. As everyone knows, it was just approved. It's still being discussed and formulated. We don't have a lot of information about how it's actually gonna work in terms of its implementation. What we do believe is going to happen though is it will be a some sort of a state grant uh, application process because there are some rules about how the money can be spent. So what we think is going to happen is the state will set up some sort of portal or some way to log onto a system. Uh, we'll have to fill out some information. What are we requesting? What are we using the money for? That will have to go through some sort of vetting and approval process. If we get through that process, then the funding will be released. Uh, so again, there's a big focus on making sure the money that's uh, being allocated is used for an appropriate pur purpose. Um, they are defined um, in terms of what kinds of things we can use uh, the money for. So we have to be very careful in terms of making sure that it, it does line up. So there's uh, things about, uh, you know, coordinating needs for low-income families, children with disabilities, English learners, um, homeless students, things like that. So those, those are categories of students where we can identify some funding, uh, purchasing educational technology, hardware, software, and connectivity. There's also money available for summer learning, um, supplemental after-school programs, mental health services, I was mentioned previously addressing some learning loss. There is some for school facilities repair that's focused on virus transmission and, and the support of student health. Um, so there's a number of things that are available to us, but it's not open-ended to be able to use for any purpose. So I think when we talk about the money, we have to make sure what we're, what we're doing is targeting the money for the purposes that they were intended to be. It's not a general pot of money we can just use as we need. And it gets back to the budget conversation. If we have some sort of revenue shortfall, it's not there just to grab and, and backfill a revenue shortfall. Um, so it's something we'll, we'll certainly have to be cognizant of, of. It's also a multi-year process. So we don't have to spend the money all in one year. We have until 2024 to spend the money so we can target um, the money and the funding and our expenses and line that up with our needs over a multi-year period as well. Thanks, Neil. Um, any follow-up on, on that? I think bottom line, there's still a lot more that needs to be shared with us as we move forward on that. Um, Neil, I'm going to stick with you on another kind of nuts and bolts question about the fund, um, the the, dis, uh, the budget. Um, Barbara, do you want to go back before I ask the next question? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Sure. Being slide that you showed with the $4 million deficit is the executive budget, correct? Yes. That the has proposed. Now, traditionally, thank God, uh, the Senate and the Assembly usually do, you know, ignore some of the things that he has in his budget and come across a little bit better in the way of districts. But we won't know that until the, the final budget is passed, right? So when you project a $4 million plus deficit the following year and then a nine million the following year, you're basing that on the current executive budget proposal, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. And when Pat was with us last week, she um, certainly um, underscored the fact that the Senate and the Assembly are trying to do much better for us. But as of today, all we really have is the executive budget. Kelly? Thanks. Um, the kind of follow up to that. So we're assuming we're not going to get, well, that cliff is assuming we're not going to get the 4.6 million and then the next year we won't get X amount of million. What if we do get that money? Does that go into, do we have a plan for that? Or does that go into like a one-time 
thing like things that maybe wouldn't need to be sustained over years or is that going to if we get that money, would it just be dumped into the fund balance or how, how would that work? Um, well, we, we will get the, the first 4.6 million that's already in the, in the works for 21, 22. That's um, previous stimulus money that's already been accounted for by the state backfilling missing state aid. Um, well, it won't, if we were to get it again, um, the question would be, is it um, filling a hole from missing state aid, like it is in the coming year, or is it on top of state aid? Um, and I don't, I mean, it just seems to me that it would be really, really unusual for us to get our state aid made whole and then all of that federal dollar on top of it. But there is questions about um, how we handle that 2.5 million if all those others are made whole. You know, for us that 2.5 million is relatively um, modest compared to, for example, Albany's I think getting 46 million and Schenectady's getting 39 million. So I think Kelly, it's a great question, but I, I don't know that we know how schools would be allowed to handle that at this point. I don't know, Neil, if your, your group of business officials has talked about anything like that. I uh, know I, you know, we're in the same spot as you explained. We really don't know how that money is is going to work. So I would say the same thing. Um, we just aren't there yet in terms of what might happen. Um, with additional funding, but it doesn't seem realistic to have a continuation of that additional funding as well. And just real quick, that American Rescue Plan, the 2.4 million, there's, well, I think this is the one that had the list of like, you mentioned last time, 19 things or right. a pretty big list of things. Could we use that money for a one-time thing like technology or I knew you, you named off a couple of things that caught my ear, like technology, um, you know, getting back into getting to the century with te technology, school repair, things that aren't a sustain things that we would need to sustain for many years. Is that in there at all, or is it? What what's the in that list? In that? Yeah, like I guess, is there anything in that on that list of things that we could use that money for? Yes, well, I question. certainly think that there are opportunities here to address some needs that don't have long-term impact. Um, technology is one of those that you sometimes have to come in and uh, once we establish it, where is that? We have to recycle that again. So we would have to make sure uh, to be careful with how we approach the technology piece. But there are certain elements of this that I think in terms of particularly addressing student needs, where hopefully we'll be able to address those student needs and won't need to be able to won't need to carry that money forward. So yeah. over the next, over the course of a year or two, whatever the impacts that we're seeing educationally uh, from the pandemic, if we can overcome some of those issues with some funding, we wouldn't need to sustain that funding going forward. So I think we'll have to look at a variety of things, educational needs, needs particularly, but then as you mentioned, maybe there's some facilities needs that we could also address uh, that wouldn't have reoccurring costs with them as well. So there's opportunities on both sides, but without having a real look at how this money, how what the requirements, how specific they are, what the process is, what the timeline is, sure. uh, they're all pieces that we're missing at this point that would help us make some of those decisions. It sounds like we had some time as well. We do, yes. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Barbara? Uh, just a, a follow-up process question. The 19 things that Neil mentioned, uh, once we pass a budget, we can't generate any more funds for that particular budget. So the things that he is mentioning for this 2.5 million that's hanging out there, would we have to build in positions or repairs or something into this year's budget? Or are we talking the following year's budget? in order to take advantage of those those monies you know as they come in or are they considered outside the budget if we were to get them it, the belief is that would all be outside of the budget so that would be that special grant process 
So we wouldn't be including the money in the budget, but we would be reaching out to the state and saying, we need X amount of dollars. Here's what we need it for. Here's our plan and how we're going to address a particular need. And again, the understanding is the state would then release that money in sort of a grant format. So there would be some follow-up reporting that we would have to, to do. So how did we spend the money? Uh, show us evidence of your expenditures. They wanna make sure that they match up with the requirements of what the money was used for, uh, those types of things. But we deal with grants now. So they're, and they're separate and apart from the regular operating budget. They work off to the side. So we're seeing a similar type of structure going forward for this money. Judy? Um, having been stung a few years ago with the gap elimination, is there any possibility that uh, we put this money, we hold on to it for later use, and then the state says, oh, sorry, we're taking this, this back? Um, the money this time was was targeted, this $2.5 million. Uh, there's right. an amount that has to go to each. It wasn't given to the states to dole out. This was the state can keep, keep a small portion of it. Uh, for some administrative expenses, but other than that, it goes to the schools, so they won't have the same opportunity to access that money as, as they have other federal money in the past. So it really is an allocation to the school district. Okay. Great questions. Um, Neil, while I have you, um, the follow-up is, there was a question in the thought exchange about our fund balance, and um, why is it low? <laughs> um, lower than our our colleagues among among the suburban uh, uh, council. Do you have some thoughts about that? Yes, I do. Um, fund balance is something we usually talk about each year as part of the budget development process, and it's an area of discretion for school districts. School districts can determine how much fund balance they want to keep, how much they want to apply to. Uh, lower taxes, that's the other function of, of fund balance. So uh, there's opportunity, how fund balance is created is basically through the budgeting process where we're estimating expenses, we're estimating revenues. At the end of the year, if we underestimate revenues, meaning we have more revenues than we thought, or overestimated expenditures, so expenditures come in less than we anticipate, it creates some extra savings. And that savings is referred to as fund balance. So it's it's really analogous to um, a savings account that you might have in your personal life. It's just got a unique name in terms of finance law for education. Uh, but it's money that we can put aside for a few, for two purposes, really. One for another future need. Um, and the other is to help out balancing the budget. So if we have uh, difficulty with the budget, um, we need to either lower expenditures or raise revenue, increase revenue. Um, we can raise revenue by using some of that savings uh, to help boost the revenue side. So we have some uh, choices around there. Over the years, we had traditionally had a very low allocation, relatively low allocation for a district our size of $300,000 in what we call appropriated fund balance. And that's money that we would target every year, put on the revenue side, uh, helps lower the, the tax levy that we the amount that we would require from taxpayers to fund the overall budget and then over the years as uh, things got a little more strained in the budget department uh, that move that doubled in, in one year went basically from three hundred thousand to six hundred and five thousand uh, dollars so that was part of, of the budget to help shore up the revenue side a little bit and, and be able to uh, add some additional expenditures and then after that it was uh, raised uh, to over 800,000 by $850,000. So we went over the course of a few years, we went from allocating $300,000 to allocating $850,000. So if you think about that, that's an annual commitment. So if you, once you put in $850,000, you have to be able to sustain that going forward. Otherwise you have to find other revenue sources or reduce expenses. There's no way to continue. We did a couple of years ago, scale that back to about $650,000, uh, but you can see this over time. If you have this $850,000 every year that you have to come up with in terms of a, of a revenue piece, it's very difficult to, to work from that in a budget scenario. So um, that's how we got low. So we, we used more of our savings to help 
fund the operations of the school district. Again, it's very hard to back down. And then again, once you make that commitment, it's you really got to be able to maintain that commitment. So we've been in this position of really not being able to add much to our fund balance at all. Um, so we're in this position right now with the executive budget proposal. We're proposing adding additional use of uh, fund balance uh, to help. We're hopeful and optimistic that in the end, we won't have to use that. Uh, but again, that is one of the reasons that our situation is a little more dire than others. We have made larger commitments to using our savings as part of our regular operating budget practice. Thanks, Neil. I'm going to I'm going to give you a break and and ask the next question to. Um, I think we'll start with Damien, but I'm going to ask um, Mike and Mike to weigh in, but not before Blanca gets a chance to ask her question. Um, I'll bring it up later. I'm sure it's going to come up again. That's fine. Okay. So one of the questions that we got was a very direct question about why we have not eliminated any instructional administrators from the budget, not any assistant principals, um, uh, why we didn't do that to save some money. Uh, this writer said it was brought up in the last thought exchange and the district seems to have um, you know, avoided or cho chosen not, not to make that reduction. So, um, Damien, can I start with you to flesh out the, the reasons why we hang on to our instructional administrators and why they're so vital for the district? Um, yeah, I, I can kick it off, I guess. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question on one hand, but on the other hand, it's one that I think comes with a, a pretty sensible answer, and that is that the work remains. Um, you know, the work of our instructional administrators is really very multifaceted. It's, it's layered upon layered upon layered of responsibilities that they have. But I would sum it up by saying that our instructional administrators are really charged with the oversight, direct oversight of our instructional programs. Um, you know, that includes any curriculum modifications, updates, enhancements, new courses, et cetera. Uh, that's kind of the 30,000 foot view, I would say, but underneath that, there are also the responsibilities of professional learning in all of our departments uh, that are, are supervised by an instructional administrator. Probably the largest amount of work comes under the requirements for the annual professional performance review, which is the teacher evaluation process, which is required by law in New York State. Um, you know, the number of observations that are required are immense. Uh, it's extremely time consuming. In most instance, instances, it includes a pre-observation conference, a post-observation con conference, an extensive write-up. Um, all of our instructional administrators are certified and trained to conduct such observations and evaluations. Um, that is a huge component of their positions and their responsibilities, and it also branches out beyond just their direct department that they oversee. Uh, one of the other APPR requirements is that we have independent evaluators who also go to basically every end of our district, whether it be elementary, middle school, high school, science, math, language arts, whatever discipline it happens to be, to serve as independent evaluators. Um, our principals do that as well. Our assistant principals also get called upon to do that. Um, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of observations, if not thousands of observations conducted over the course of a school year. Um, so that's a huge component of their position. They're also responsible for all of the budgeting, including the planning, the procurement of materials, supplies, textbooks, um, software, et cetera. Um, the inventory, the maintenance of all of the instructional tools and resources and strategies that we need to obtain to make sure that the instruction is sound and moving forward. Uh, in many instances, they are coordinating substitutes, which happens on a daily basis. Um, you know, in most in instances, we are aware, but on many occasions, we may get a, a very last minute notice that we will have a, a teacher out and, and the in instructional administrator would be called upon to basically problem solve on the spot. Um, I mentioned all of the curriculum development as well. Uh, you know, we are regularly receiving uh, new learning standards from the state that have to be implemented that call upon us to revise or update or realign all, all of our instructional programs. 
our instructional administrators are intimately involved with student placements, teaching assignments, um, support staff coordination. And then the other part of it that I don't want to lose sight of it of is just the day to day. Um, you know, I, I think this year has been extreme in the day to day responsibilities, but even under normal circumstances, just the day to day needs to address student needs, to address teacher needs, classroom needs, um, engage in communications on an ongoing and hopefully productive and constructive way with all of our parent community. Um, in, yeah, I mean, it, the the day to day needs are pretty immense um, and not often predictable, but somebody needs to be there to respond to those and our instructional administrators are often at the front line of that response. So, you know, those are a, a few things, but I think just generally speaking, I think they are the people who serve really as the gatekeepers for excellence for our instructional programs. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to devalue that or undervalue that I often like when I hear a a statement about cutting an instructional administrator, I also think about, well, which one would we cut? And who's going to do the work? And it's, you know, it's easy to say to cut or reduce, but there also has to be an understanding of how do we backfill that then? Who's going to complete these tasks and these responsibilities? It's, it's not just going to fall into a vacuum. The work doesn't go away. The work remains. Um, and you know, we have a, a great team of instructional administrators, all who, of whom are certified and able and ready to complete the administrative work that is, is really a critical component of, component of a, a well-functioning school district. Thanks, Damien. Gloria, I see your hand. I was wondering, Damien, um, what's the average number of staff that an instructional administrator might be responsible for? So, um, good question, great question. In you know, some of the larger departments like at the high school, for example, I'll take, uh, you know, our math science administrator, instructional administrator at the high school. She, I believe, has 40 plus teachers that she is working with. Um, when you compare that to other instructional administrator assignments, for example, Shannon Elliott, who oversees ART K-12, while it's a smaller department at one particular level, you're not going to have that number of teachers. When you spread it out across the K through 12, um, you know, you have the complexity of, of essentially overseeing a K through 12 program at multiple levels, but then the numbers also increase of the number of teachers that you have to super, supervise and work with. Um, but I would say the maximum number, number is, is low 40s. Um, we have some instructional administrators who take on multiple departments simply because they have multiple smaller departments. I'll keep using Shannon Elliott. So Shannon Elliott also oversees our business department at the high school, our family and consumer sciences program at the middle school. Um, you know, so the combination, the combined effect is that they have a, a fairly high number of teachers that they have to work with and supervise as well. Blanca, and then Gloria, and then Seema, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Blanca. Thank you. Um, how do we compare? Would you have a sense, Damien, of how we compare to other districts our size? Do we have more of these folks in other districts or less? Um, I, I believe we are quite lean, relatively speaking. I don't know of any districts that are equivalent size to us that do not have some equivalent of an instructional administrator. They might have a different title. Some call them, uh, you know, just supervisors or instructional supervisors. But of districts this size, I'm not aware of any that don't have, you know, an equivalent structure of some form. Some might maintain K through 12 supervisors who oversee one subject area, for example. So they may have a K through 12 math supervisor, whereas we also value the site-based supervision quite a bit. So, you know, some of our supervisors will take on multiple areas so that they can be a site-based supervisor in our largest schools, being our high school and our middle school, of course. Um, so our high school math supervisor, for example, is the supervisor of math, science, and technology, not just one subject area. Um, so there are, there are nuances, but, you know, essentially every district that I'm aware of that is of, equi of an equivalent size to us has some form of an instructional administration component built into their, their overall administrative uh, organizational chart. Sima? 
Um, I just had a question because I know that a position that um, you were suggesting to as like 0 0.7 AP and then 0.3 as a uh, equity um, diversity, uh, I guess, leadership piece. So that position would just be at the high school. So I'm not really sure how that person would be impacting all seven buildings. And so I know that other districts have different structures of instructional administrators, APs, et cetera. And so since we have that AP, I guess, hole that we're trying to fill up and um, you know, make whole, and we're also adding this other piece of a job, I don't see why we wouldn't look at the structures like all together and see what other model could we come up with. This is like a great opportunity to, to see what other options we have. I mean, I would like to see another model. People have asked for this more than once. More than one person has asked for this. You know, we have the thought exchange for a reason. People are asking about it. I feel like we should be able to get at least something is an option to look at. Seema, I think that's a great idea to look at other options. We've, we've done that a couple times in the past, but we haven't done it in the last five or six years. Um, I, I guess I would just say that right now as we're coming out of a pandemic and everyone's role really has been scrambled to a certain extent this past year, that it might be something to look very closely at in the coming year as we're coming out of it. But we're kind of in, we're not kind of, we are in recovery mode um, in terms of getting students back in place. Um, but we've had, we've had the conversation about K-12 uh, administrators several times because, you know, the, the trade-off there is you get, you get continuity across the three levels, but you also have people who are less visible in any given building. So, for example, we, we have a um, special education ad instructional administrator who's split across the middle and high school. And if she were on this call right now, she would tell you that when she when she needs she's needed in the middle school, she's at the high school and vice versa. She's never where people want her, even though she's running around. So, I mean, I, I think it's worth looking at. Um, I mean, we're, you yeah. know, we're already looking at later start. I mean, the idea is that. COVID broke down so many things. So we're making changes because we have to make changes for next year. So I don't see why we wouldn't look at that when people are asking for it. And there are other, there are other models like the APs can, can do observations. Um, teacher leaders can do other parts that IAs are doing. There, there are other options, I guess is what I'm saying. There are other, are other structures. So um, our APs do um uh observations for sure and our teacher leaders uh, do have a role as well but they don't do observations they they're not certified administrators so if if teacher leaders get more leadership duties um then we need to backfill with more teachers because they're teaching but you know your your points well taken i just don't know that we can redo our leadership model for september It'd be a heavy lift. Um, Mike Piscatelli, oh, I'm sorry, Seema, did you, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, I mean, you know, we have a thought exchange. People ask, you know, we ask for people input and then several people write this more than once. And then we don't even give it like consideration of options, which, you know, I understand it's a heavy lift, but, you know, I guess everything is a heavy lift right now. That's true. I, I think that, you know, the diversity and equity position could be a K-12 position as well, giving it to as, as a high school position for a point three is essentially going to be at the high school. They're not going to make it to seven buildings if that's less, less than half their job. I just, I don't know. I don't know how other people feel, but I, I, I would really like to see other options. You know, Marie, I, I can comment. I mean, one of the things I, that might be valuable is to have a more detailed conversation about the administrative roles that we're doing right now. Because sometimes, as Damien's explaining, sometimes I don't feel like there's a clear understanding of what an instructional administrator does on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's easy to minimize it because they are doing a lot of the work that's behind the scenes, but it's such critical work 
to, to support the teachers and to support the building. They're a critical part of the high school building team and same at the middle school as well. And they're supporting the elementary programs as well. And, you know, they, they cover like the building site administrators that we have there. Uh, like we have the math and science and the uh, English um, at the high school and at the middle school. They serve valuable roles to help backfill things with, that we have like safety, if we have to do safety protocols. When we have situations where an administrator is gonna be out, they're filling in and supporting those roles. You know, as Damien said, they are like our critical component as far as instructional leadership. So when we're making plans about professional development plans and how are we gonna implement this building wide? Number one, they're providing critical feedback in the planning stages, but then when we implement it, they are taking that message and working with the teachers individually with the expertise in the content area that they supervise. And I think that can get lost. They're also a huge access point for parents and students in those particular areas. If you talk to a music parent, they're gonna to want to talk to the music supervisor who has expertise in how to develop a music program. If you wanna talk about my child who's struggling in math, they go to an instructional administrator who is an expert in math and can sit down with the student and problem solve with them and the teacher or do parent-teacher conferences just with, with that student and that parent. So I just, I just think it gets very easy to not recognize the importance they have to the, to the district. Yeah, and I just wanna be clear, I'm not minimizing their work. I'm just saying that I know other models and structures exist. So I just think that we should at least consider other structures and models. I, I don't think that they're doing nothing. I'm just saying that there could be other ways to do it. Seema, if I can just jump in really quickly on this one too. I, I think it's important to note that we have looked at other structures over the years. Um, we did a comprehensive study of the administrative structure. I don't even know when it was, like 2008, 2009, I think it was. And it looked at really all of the, you know, the various options that are out there, whether it be K through 12 administrators, whether they be site-based administrators, whether, you know, it be a combination of teacher leadership, which is essentially what we have. I mean, we have 50 some odd teacher leaders in our district already. Um, so I, I don't want it to be just assumed that we haven't looked at other, other structures over the years. We certainly have. Um, I know it's a conversation that we have every year when it comes around to budget time too, is, you know, what's the best way for us to complete the work and get the work done? And, you know, the structure that we have, I mean, you can always say that there are other ways that you can do things for sure, but there are also some benefits to the structure that we have that we don't want to lose sight of also. Uh, Gloria, then Barbara. Sorry, thanks, Damien. I was, uh, Damien, I was going to say the same thing because I remember uh, it was a year after I had retired and got on the board that we began that look at, uh, and I remember the whole conversation about site-based versus, you know, district-wide and how we, you know, we, we kind of shaped the direction we wanted to go based on the needs of our district, not necessarily another district. So we ended up where we were, we are now because of some decisions that were made based on what we wanted and the direction we wished to go and the positive things that we valued that this structure gave us, whereas the other didn't. So that was done. And, uh, you know, I, I was very happy with the way we went about it. But I also agree that we always need to look, we always need to come back and look. If people are asking, it's it's obvious it, either they don't understand, and I go back to what Mike said before, I think we need to be clear so that people who are calling for a change, and maybe they're not saying a change, let's just look at it, which is fine, but let's understand what we have and why it's the way it is. And then, you know, I, I agree, I agree, Seema, we shouldn't just keep something for the sake of keeping it. We've had it, you know, for so many years, but I also think we need to do it very deliberately and over time. I don't think it's something you just jump into now for next September, because I remember how we studied it and looked at it and visited and talked with other, you know, districts and how it worked and how long it took us to come down with a model that fed and met our needs, not somebody else's, but it takes time. Uh, and I would be supportive of doing that, but I would not be supportive of saying, well, I want to do this by September. Um, 
because I know I know the time and thought that went into this model that we have now and how much it means. Barbara? I guess I just had a little different interpretation of the thought exchange. Um, people know that we have a vacant AP position. And I think people realize that you aren't going to cut somebody out of a job unless you are in the direst of circumstances. But I think the question was, you know, do we need to fill that AP position? And Marie, you explained uh, the last meeting that, you know, with the students coming back into the building and, you know, obviously a, a year of very traumatized learning that you felt that it needed to be filled. But I interpreted the thought exchange, not so much the IA administrators, which I think if the public are listening, uh, really sort of get a better picture of what these individuals do with the explanations that were given tonight. But I think the question that I've heard, you know, well, why, why would you fill that AP position? I think that to me was the question that, that I heard more about rather than these, you know, instructional administrators. Mike, can I put Mike uh, Piscatelli, can I put you on the spot? This is your building. We had this very conversation. It's just really important to know we've been functioning with two assistant principals since uh, Dr. Halchak left. Um, and we're able to do that because at the moment we are dealing with pretty much no discipline problems. And the minute we return to full capacity, I am anticipating that will not be the case. Um, you know, it's, it, it's again, with four grade levels of students and 1500 students in the building, there is a need for a, that third assistant principal when we are when we are dealing with the managing of the students. Now, as we've said too, there, the component that's different this year, even compared to normal years, is the social emotional needs that the students are going to have transitioning back into a normal school year. And I think we're going to need all hands on deck to really support those students and. Our assistant principals are really key in that. They're, you know, as we were talking about the instructional ministers being the face of the with the teachers, the the assistant principals are our big interaction with the students, and and they are the ones meeting with the students and problem solving and supporting them. And you know, as we as we move into, we've been over the years, we've been moving into a philosophy of discipline where we're trying to take it more of a counseling approach than a, a uh, strict consequence approach. And with that, that takes time. And um, when we are, I'll just use another example. When we're dealing with a significant issue, that usually ties up to assistant principals for an extended period of time, which means anything else that's going on in the building falls on the remaining administrators which, um, so if we have something happening right now and that ties up my two APs, basically I'm the one who's gotta deal with anything else that happens on it. So anyways, there's, I really feel there is a need in for the third assistant principal um, from all the reasons I just listed. Mike, for the public's benefit, uh, probably not now off the top of your head, but at our next meeting, maybe just sort of tell what these assistant principals do, you know, from the standpoint of scheduling, not just the discipline, but everything else that you know that they do. If we could maybe just make a list posted or whatever, just so that people appreciate what these folks are actually doing. You know, and to Seema's point, I mean, I'll go back to something Seema said, we, you know, it is, Barbara, you're bringing up an excellent point. The assistant principals um, have other, other responsibilities, like one of the assistant principals is in charge of the master scheduling process. One of our assistant principals is in charge of all of our testing programs from AP to regents and so forth. One of our assistant principals is in charge of all our alternate programs, including the focus program, Alted and CTE. Um, you know, all of these things that we're talking about, and there's many, many, many more, they take time and they take time to manage them, supervise and oversee. And um, to what Seema was talking about, we are looking at those responsibilities now that we do have a vacancy. And we're saying, okay, 
yeah, we, we know how this was structured in the past, but are there things we can do differently to make it, um, to improve our oversight of these programs? So, but I think that's a very good idea. Just like the other conversation, I think we can certainly kind of provide more information about exactly what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Mike Laster and then Seema. Thanks. Uh, I, I want to just echo what Damien and Mike have been talking about. You guys have done an excellent job uh, explaining sort of what our instructional administrators mean to the mission of the school district. I guess my, my only comments in addition to what they said was I would be concerned about making any uh, drastic changes just because of the anticipated learning loss that we're looking you know, towards with the students coming back from the pandemic. Um, the support that our IAs give our teachers, um, especially from, I guess, the lens of at least, at the least of the middle school, our site-based IAs manage all of our AIS programs um, and the data analysis associated with that and the ESSA reporting that we have to do. Um, I don't know. I would, be, uh, I would be a little nervous about making any changes to that right now, especially since we're, we're going to be dealing with coming back from the pandemic. So, Seema? Um, I just had a question about the the AP position. I guess uh, two parts is um, is the idea that that point I don't know if it was a point three or point four point three position supposed to be across the district, and then also when you post it, um, are you expecting that the person is an AP and also has some kind of qualification or experience with diversity and equity, or do you think that there is that something that they're going to have to just you know do on their like I guess I'm trying to figure out. How would that be posted? Uh, we would like someone with expertise in that area would be a great way to do it. And the and the idea is, yes, as a start, it's a 0.3. Um, I tried to push Mr. Piscatelli to a 0.5, but we arm wrestled and uh, he's stronger than I am. And <laughs> um, it's a start. So it's essentially a day and a half a week. Um, some of which we would like this person to reach out to, particularly our elementary buildings. Um, Mike and his team at the middle school have, have been able to um, sustain a strong agenda around this topic, but it's been more diffuse at the elementary buildings, um, really just to help, but it's also a starting point. I don't know that it's an ending point. Uh, I would love to have a 1.0 person whose job it was to be the coordinator of equity and diversity across our district. Um, but, you know, this is not the time to be adding positions. Um, you know, we're just not at that place. As things unfold, you know, if the state budget comes back better or how this um, stimulus money becomes available to us, it may free up resources in different ways that we can do something but this is a way really to start. I guess I just worry that, I mean, it sounds like the AP job by itself is a lot of work and then diversity and equity across seven buildings is a lot of work. So to put them in one position, I feel like it's going to be, I don't know, pretty difficult to do, you know, a great job in both. And again, I'm not saying that we have to add, obviously we don't have anything in the budget to add, but to think about restructuring. And I think it's going to be hard to find somebody that's an AP and that has, that experience. Mike, Ms. Catelli. Seema, as far as the structuring of the work, we're, we're trying to keep that in mind when we're looking at the, the building assignments to make sure that what we are putting under that assistant principal takes into consideration that they're going to be gone part of the time as well. So we're trying to consider that as we're designing the responsibilities. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I'm, if I may, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We had several comments in the thought exchange about um, uh, adding teacher, teaching assistants or returning teaching assistants to classrooms and also um, around reading and other supports for elementary students. So, Alan, can I um, turn to you to talk a little bit about what TAs and reading teachers did this year and what your hope will be for next year, because it is true we, we have not added more positions. Um, our goal is to maintain, not to add. 
Right, right. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, our, our teaching assistants and our reading teachers have sure uh, <laughs> done an amazing job this year and uh, work that they're not generally uh, accustomed to. Um, as most of our buildings have switched into this cohort model, um, at most of our buildings and most of our grade levels, we have uh, more cohorts than we have certified classroom teachers. Um, so those classroom teachers are rotating from classroom to classroom to provide content area instruction. But at any given time, there's a classroom cohort that doesn't have a certified classroom teacher in there with them. So at those times, um, we're using our reading teachers or our teaching assistants to provide um, supervision, uh, first and foremost, um, but whatever instruction uh, that they can provide. Our teaching assistants are, are providing uh, supervision. They're, they're um, also supervising recess and snack times, times when our, our certified instructional staff don't necessarily need to be present, but our reading teachers are taking advantage of that time in those classroom cohorts to provide uh, phonics instruction or to try and work with um, small groups of students to provide some, some reading intervention. Um, it's worked out pretty well for us so far this year, but we are all very much looking forward to next year and, and going back to our um, normal roles. Um, we don't have right now the uh, kindergarten or the first grade instructional teaching assistants um, that we typically have. Um, that's been balanced a little bit by the idea that we have cohorts of only 14 um, in most of our classrooms. But as we look at next year and look at going back to our regular class sizes, uh, we know that we're going to need those teaching assistants back um, in their more typical role, uh, you know, working with the classroom teachers to provide small group work um, and to help them get ready for lessons and prepare uh, for regular content area instruction. Our reading teachers, likewise, will be um, heading back to their more normal role of, of just providing reading intervention services to students. Um, and while we would, you know, there's always conversation about do we need more intervention staff, you know, I, I do want to point out a, a couple of things. Um, we are afraid of what we may see next year in terms of learning loss, but our experiences so far this year with our primary students in particular, um, a lot of the students that came to us in the fall that had demonstrated learning loss uh, since March of last year, quickly rebounded with quality instruction. Um, so a lot of those deficits and those gaps um, really resolved themselves once they were back in the normal classroom routine and receiving regular uh, high quality instruction. Uh, I also want to say that um, one of the differences this year is in the, I would say, in the quality of the remote instruction that our students are receiving. Um, this year, um, the teachers who have taken on those remote assignments are really knocking it out of the park. They're doing a great job working with those students and providing a level of instruction that, you know, last March or last April, we wouldn't have dreamed about had would be possible. So um, they're doing great work. And I also just want to say that, well, a couple more points is that um, one thing that one program that we're looking to expand and continuing to grow is our literacy coaching model. Um, so as our literacy coaches come online in the different buildings, we're hoping that, you know, they will continue to work with classroom teachers to help them think through their instruction, help them improve the efficiency of their instruction and reduce the need for specialized intervention staff over time. And finally, one thing that we've been talking about with Damien quite a lot is um, really being more flexible with the deployment of our, instru our reading instru instructors um, and moving them around a little bit more to address the needs 
where they're at. So instead of having um, specific staff members assigned to specific buildings, if one building has more of a need than uh, anticipated, being flexible and, and deploying people in a way that's equitable across all of the buildings. So I think with all those components in place, I, I think we're actually pretty well situated for um, where we're, what we need for our reading instruction for next year. Thanks, Alan. That was um, really very thorough kind of reflection of what we're doing this year and then where we hope to be next. Um, one of the other topics that came up a lot in the thought exchange was class size. There was a lot of appreciation for the fact that we're trying to maintain lower class sizes across the district. Um, but there's a couple spots where that's a challenge. Um, and Mr. Laster knows it's coming toward him. Uh, our seventh grade class size numbers are high. Um, and it's hard to explain ex exactly how to fix that easily. But I know you can do it, Mr. Laster. So can you help our community understand why those numbers are what they are? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Wiles. So uh, two years ago, actually, when we were pre preparing to welcome uh, that cohort into the middle school, we saw that bubble coming through the system. Uh, and we originally came to the Board of Education looking to see if we could get 16 sections across the um, uh, sixth grade level. Uh, and unfortunately, due to the fiscal constraints at the time, you know, we were not able to, to get 16 sections uh, when they came into the middle school. Um, because of the middle school philosophy and organization and structure of teaming, it's not as easy as just adding one teacher to help decrease our class sizes. Um, each, each grade level requires more than one FTE uh, to try to decrease class sizes. So if we wanted to say add another team at the seventh grade level, we would need four team teachers, uh, but then we would also need in addition, all of the encore uh, teachers to teach those kids the specials. So it, it becomes it, it becomes very expensive very quickly. Uh, so, so that's basically why this, bu this bubble that's moving through the middle school right now is, is at the upper end of the Board of Education class size thresholds. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, we're, we're de we definitely have our eye on it. Um, it's definitely something that, um, you, you know, the interventions and the proactive conversations that we're having about supporting our seventh graders next year are, are going to come into play. And that's, and that's the benefit of a middle level philosophy and a teaming model and that small learning community. So um, that's why it's, it's not as easy as just adding one more teacher to dec decrease the class size. All right, thanks. It is a complicated puzzle to put together. Um, Mike Piscatelli, we also had a, a couple questions or comments about class size at the high school because um, there are 1.7 FTEs worth of reductions that are enrollment driven. And there is a concern that by reducing those FTEs, class sizes will be um, increased at the high school. Can you talk about that a little bit? So as you said in the, in the question, when you're framing the question, our reductions were based on enrollment decreases in the high school. So um, to prepare for this, this meeting tonight, I took a look at uh, all of our requests in um, really our, the content areas where we always see higher numbers, math, science, English, social studies, and world language just to see where our class averages are falling out right now with current requests. And right now, our region's classes are falling around a class average of 23 students. Um, our honors AP slash college sections are falling in that 25 to 26 range, um, like as an average. So those levels are pretty, are pretty um, typical of what we've been doing the last three or four years. Um, so we're not seeing any kind of dramatic swings in class size average at the high school based on these reductions. Now remember, different courses based on how requests fall, you might have a course that's going to average out at 30 students per section. But that's no different than any other year when we're scheduling classes. It just it depends on what, you know, um, if there's higher demand in that grade level this year or so forth from there. Thanks for doing that um, analysis, Mike. Um, 
I'm going to shift gears a little bit and go back to the topic of diversity. There was a, a question in the thought exchange um, that said, students are very diverse and growing more so. Teachers are still very homogenous. This might be someone who saw our slide deck from the Equity and Diversity Committee. And um, the question goes on, kids need to be able to see people who look like them in leadership. Um, so, uh, and then there's a follow-up question about what are we doing to try to um, increase the diversity of our employees, both faculty and staff? So Regan, can I turn to you for that? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, so we've, um, we've done a few things actually and, and they're working on more. We've revised all of our postings, uh, revised some of the language in there to um, that are customarily associated with maybe attracting a certain gender or, or a certain race. So we've revised um, our language and our postings. Um, we've got outreach going out to colleges across the state where um, especially uh, those in bigger cities where there are more diverse candidates. So we're trying to attract more diverse candidates from, from those colleges about a specific uh, opening that we might have. Um, we've revised our interview uh, processes. Um, we uh, are creating a video for all of our um, interview teams to uh, view and, and watch before the interview to, to know what their role is um, and uh, to make sure that they understand the, the role of bias um, and what that does in an interview situation. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing a bunch of different things, but obviously the biggest thing is we've got to be able to attract diverse candidates to our district. And that's where we're really trying to put a lot of our focus on. We can't hire people that don't, don't apply for our position. So we're really trying to, to, to do that. Thank, thanks, Regan. One of the comment, one of the comments was that, um, a reader was disappointed that the diversity did not seem to be a priority of the board and, um, I, I just wanted to remind our community that actually working on diversity was an overarching goal for the board set way back in the summer. Um, it may not have emerged immediately through the budget process, but um, we know that we will be doing quite a bit of hiring in the next months because we've had a number of retirements. So we are working hard at that. Um, and then one other small detail we actually got a question from a community member wanting to know the makeup of our equity and diversity committee with respect to what percentage actually have children um, in school right now and i looked at this today and we're actually 50 50 50 percent of that committee have children in school right now uh, four of those committee members are actually in school right now so we have a very strong um, representative pool of, of individuals who are deeply connected um, to the community. I have one more for Regan, and this is about vaccinations. Um, and that is, will children be required to be vaccinated and will employees be required to be vaccinated going forward? Great, great question. Um, the answer right now is, is no, they're not currently required. I know yesterday, um, the governor, uh, day before the governor changed, or lowered the um, the ages. And so 16 year olds as of, I think next week can start to get vaccinated. Um, so I'm not sure about that. What's what, who knows? Um, but as of right now, the answer is no. Um, and so we can't require employees and we obviously can't require students to do that quite yet. We'll keep an eye on that. Yep. Thank you. Rebecca, you've been very patient with your hand. I'm so sorry. That's quite all right. Just about um, you know what you were just saying, Dr. Wiles and, and Regan about um, you know our our goal for the year was really to enhance diversity and equity, and I know you already had this conversation with um, Mr. Piscatelli, but any thought about moving that um, point three assistant principal position to more like a point five to reflect our goal? Jeez. <clears throat> Why do well, I feel like everyone's looking at me? Because <laughs> they are, Mr. Piscatelli. I think, um, Mike, I'll, I'll bail in, jump in here. We, we did talk a lot about what the balance should be. And I think we landed at point three, I will say, as a starting point, just because of a certain level of uncertainty about next year. 
um, and just what student needs will be when they're back in the building altogether. And that's just, um, and that's true for, you know, what we'll need in terms of um, academic intervention supports and reading supports and math supports and social emotional supports. I mean, we have a sense that our students are going to need a lot, but what that exactly looks like is a little bit of a mystery to us right now. And then the other thing I'll just mention is that, you know, this, um, the Recovery Act money that we're talking about is for these uncertainties. So we have to keep that in mind as well. But I, I think because of that, that's where we landed at the point three. It's a start, um, but it's, you know, an ongoing conversation. Barbara? Just a quick follow-up. Um, when we establish the committee and in our discussions earlier prior to establishing that, we were very determined to call it the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee because we wanted all groups, special ed, English language learners and all that. And I just keep hearing you, Dr. Wells and Seema and, and some others basically just saying D and diversity and equity. And I, I just don't want to lose that inclusion piece because that was the original intent at, in, in all our discussions. Barbara, they, when we created the committee though, I mean, it's officially created by the board and it's called the Equity and Diversity Committee. It doesn't mean we're not focusing on inclusion. And in fact, you know, um, Amy Perrot, our communication specialist is trying to get the tab on our banner in the website to have all three of those words. But if we're going to change the name of the committee, the board would have to like change the name of the committee. It's, it's just where we landed and at the time. Um, Seema and then Mike. Uh, I think Mike was first actually. Okay, Mike and then Seema. Oh, I just wanted to provide uh, some perspective. You know, at the middle school, we only have two house principals. Uh, we only have three grade levels. And there's many days that we are stretched. Uh, and during a normal school year, um, I, you know, with a, and ha having an additional grade level at the high school, I, I would be very, very concerned about like the, the, just the unknown about bringing those kids back next year because the, the the pace is going to increase to back to where it was um, before the pandemic. Um, so I just wanted to add that perspective, that's it. Thank you. Seema and then Regan. Um, I just have two questions. Um, one is, oh, so is there, I know you said this is a start Dr. Wiles with the point three, but did you have something in mind after that? Does that, whoever gets hired in that position does that change or you just you can't know until that you hire that person? I I mean, I don't have a master plan here other than to get a start um, and, and assess and see what our needs are. And I think, um, I don't know who just brought it up, but the four grades, like if you had four assistant principals at the high school, um, they all can do observations, correct? Right? as assistant principals and then yeah. um, and IAs like they were teachers before correct so they so like for example the science and math IA was it either a science or math teacher so they don't have the content of the other and same with English and social studies right so if they were just put in administrative positions like APs I feel like it would be a little bit you know what I mean like the science whoever the IA is for science and math they're going to, you know, have experience a lot more in one area, science or math. So that the other, you know, the other academic group is not getting the same equivalent, I, I don't think. I know you can try your best to hire um, a person that can do both, but they won't be a math teacher. You know what I mean? Just like a social studies teacher will not be an English teacher. That's just not who they were when they were teaching. So I feel like having APs would be more, I don't know, equitable for all the different academic groups. I mean, that's another way to, to structure as well. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just think that the, we have thought exchange. We ask people to, to 
submit questions and then we ask people to submit more questions and then they're they're asking the questions but then we're not even considering other options we're basically coming here with thanks for sending in your questions but this is this is the plan well Seema, i think we're talking about it right now i think that's important um i mean this may be the plan for march 30th but it doesn't have to be the plan forever um I think it's important to listen to what people are saying and to and to explore different options um, and see where it takes us. Um, Regan? I just wanted to go back. I, I, I forgot one of the other things that, that uh, I think is important that we're doing around uh, equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, we know that, that people uh, go to our website and so they're looking to see what we're doing. Um, and so now we've got a we've got a tab of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, that right there, we know attracts people of of uh, diverse backgrounds. They want to see that we're doing the work, and we're talking about the things that we're talking about. So we're looking to to make the website um, bigger in that area. And so we'll be constantly adding things to that. Thanks, Regan. Blanca. So. Um... I also looked through the thought exchange before tonight. I'm hoping there's a couple things you're still going to discuss. But with regard to the instructional administrators, um, I am a taxpayer and a mother of, of three children, one of whom I withdrew from the district, as you know. Um, I have never had contact with an instructional administrator. So it's it's a tough pill to swallow as a taxpayer to have to uh you know pay more taxes even if it doesn't seem like it's a lot per person um and feel like you're not getting something new and also not have um to Zima's point have that instructional um, administrator um, position addressed in some way so i do think we need to revisit it that being said tonight's discussion was extremely helpful I have a different perception now. You have Damien has taught me a lot tonight about their role, and I do see it as important. So while I think we should look at restructuring it, I don't actually think we should do that this year. I would agree to with Gloria and with um, Damien and you that Marie that it's probably not a good time to do so. Um, so I guess uh, my point is this: one, I'm concerned that we are uh, asking for folks to pay more. I feel like I've been paying through the nose for a long time and I don't understand still, even though Neil explained it, how we could be performing so low in terms of that, that fund where we're like 13 out of 13. Um, and, and so that piece is frustrating. And I think that that's where this concern about the instructional administrators is coming from. I really do. Folks wanna know why we're paying so much in taxes what well, we're being taxed to death and, and we, we are low in the fund and, and being asked for more right after a pandemic and we're not cutting um, administrators, which is what they said they wanted. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. I did learn a lot though, and I don't think this is the time to um, restructure that particular piece. My two cents. Thanks, Blanca. Um, I'm going to transition us a little bit here with a couple transportation questions and then I know um, there's a lot of interest in talking about the topic of start time and I have some um, uh, things I want to share with about that and then questions as well um, but uh, Neil there were a couple questions in the thought exchange about transportation costs one in particular was uh, what happened to savings we might have um, um realized when we closed down last year from march to june from transportation when we didn't have children coming to school and what happened to those funds uh, sure so as everyone knows uh, last march over a year ago march um schools were shut down due to the coronavirus it was shortly after that that um, congress passed the first CARES act so it was almost a year ago and one of the provisions in there was that in order for schools to receive the federal funding, they had to continue to pay their employees during the period of any disruption or closure related to the coronavirus. And if you can recall at that time, there was a real concern about everybody getting laid off 
um, massive unemployment and those sorts of things going on. So that was a provision specifically put into that language that says as is an obligation to receiving the money, you need to keep these employees employed and working, uh, so to speak, so that we don't have this massive unemployment going on through, across the country. Uh, so we continued to do that. Now, what we did do is make sure that employees understood that um, you're getting paid and you're also re then ready and available for work. So in, in back then, we didn't know how long, what was gonna happen, is this two weeks, is it a month, is it six weeks? Um, we found out it, it, what it meant after a while, certainly in terms of a long-term shutdown. But in the beginning, we really didn't know how long that was going to be. Uh, so that was the point of making sure that, you know, those individuals were ready and available for work. So if we did go back or go back in some form, they were ready to do so. They're on the payroll and ready to go. And we had access to them. Um, but that also created, obviously, we didn't come back. So that also created some savings, not on the employee side, but in terms of not running our buses. So we didn't have our buses uh, running. We weren't using fuel. Our maintenance was much less. So we did accrue some savings uh, between March and the end of the school year than we would have otherwise. We would have had expenditures during that time. So that money then could serve two purposes. Uh, one is if we have savings, just like we do in any other part of the budget, it, we can transfer money to other parts where we need it. So a budget is a plan. The plan is developed well in advance of the fiscal year in which we're acting. So in certain situations, we have areas where we didn't expect to have so many expenditures exceed those expenditures and other areas where we thought we were gonna have expenditures and, and we didn't have them. So we're able to transfer money between accounts and, and we can do that with board approval. So that money was available for that purpose if we needed it in another area, such as purchase of PPE, which we, we had to go on a shopping spree. Uh, for that and didn't ha anticipate that at, in the beginning of the year when we developed the budget. Uh, but the other purpose is, is again, is um, fund balance. So if we have savings where we don't need that money in other areas, that becomes surplus funds at the end of the year, we're able to accumulate those in what we call fund balance. And, and that becomes available for future years to help with um, the revenue side in, as we discussed, not having an, as much um, fund balance as other school district, that is another way to create fund balances to have expenditure savings in a, in a current year, which can be accumulated and then used or saved in for future years. Uh, so that's really the two aspects to that question in terms of what happened with transportation and where did, where did the um, funds go that weren't needed to be utilized during that time period. Thanks, Neil. By, by way of transition, um, I'm, I'm going to move to the start time discussion if everyone is okay with that. But there's a question here that says, boy, it sure seems like start and end times are extremely dependent on school buses. Maybe we should just have more school buses. Any thoughts on that? Mr. Sanders? Uh, yeah, school buses are very expensive. <laughs> Um, that's one, um, you know, upwards of a hundred thousand dollars. So, um, so school buses are one issue, you know, we have to pay for those. Uh, we do get some state aid back, but it's, it's about 60%. So we're still, um, having about 40% of the cost. Uh, the other issue beyond that, which is a, a more challenging issue really is having the availability of drivers. And there is a, I wouldn't call it a local shortage. It's a statewide shortage. There just aren't enough people willing to become school bus drivers uh, to have a, a repertoire of people available when you need them. So we have been struggling as every other district. Um, if you get the Times Union, you will periodically see very large ads, excuse me, for uh, bus drivers from various school districts. It's not only us. Um, don't know all of the reasons uh, for that, but we certainly have seen this over the past several years where um, people that used to take these types of positions are, are no longer interested in, in doing that. Our population of drivers um, is on the higher end of the age scale. So this is not um, younger people that traditionally want to become uh, drivers. They're people that are toward the end of their career and look at this as another opportunity. Um, so that's one aspect. I, I will tell you very candidly and another aspect is um, there's very stringent requirements for bus drivers in terms of uh, physical performance tests that have to be followed. Um, 
drug and alcohol uh, can't be consumed. Uh, there's regular testing for that. Uh, so there's um, some things that people have to keep in mind when applying for those positions. But um, just we've we've tried many different avenues to try to increase our cadre of, of potential bus drivers. Um, haven't found the magic solution yet. Um, so even though we can buy more buses at this point, we wouldn't have anybody to drive them. And that really is becoming a real challenge for all school districts across New York State. And I, I asked you to finish on that question because the, the lack of um, options that we have and flexibility that we have around transportation really has um, driven, no pun intended, a lot of our conversations around looking at um, different start times. Um, and many, many, many comments that came in the thought exchange were, you know, why don't, can't you be more creative? Can't you think out of the box? Um, aren't there ways you can problem solve this? And so many of the um, places where we get stuck are with um, transportation. And when you factor in our geography here in Gilderland, um, our seven distinct school campuses, the location of the bus garage, the nature of traffic on Western Avenue 146. These are all unique to Gilderland. So a Shenandoah may not have these issues, a Bethlehem might, because they're geographically set up a little bit different. So while we like to compare ourselves across our neighbors, um, it doesn't always work, again, because of just the geography and the real estate we need to cover. So um, I'm going to, uh, does anyone have any other questions on any of the topics we've already covered? Because I am mindful of the time here. Um, all right, so I'll, Barbara, go ahead. This is just a quickie. Um, if we do get more state aid from the uh, Senate and the Assembly uh, versions, uh, could we consider at least putting more TAs um, as potential hires, sort of like the FTEs that we did for teachers, you know, the 5.7 in the event we need them? Um, one of the things that, that Alan pointed out is that this year our reading teachers uh, many times couldn't do their, their reading duties because they were helping with the cohort. And I, I'm just wondering if, if we do get a little more money, if perhaps you would consider just putting in a, a few more TA positions so that our reading teachers could be freed up, um, you know, to do the work that uh, they were originally intended to do. Just a thought. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so let me transition here. Whoops, sorry, I got an error. So um, let me um, just uh, refresh a little memories. And the first thing I want to show is a revised start times for 2021-2022. Um, this addresses some of the many uh, um, comments in the thought exchange about contractual issues. Uh, we did have... Um, the end time in the elementary schools had been two o'clock. That had 10 minutes too much time um, taking away from teacher planning time. So we have amended that a little bit. So these are slightly revised to address that, but I did not take the asterisk away because we're still working on this. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you. Um, the next slide is, um, the teacher work day at the elementary level. And Alan Lockwood, can I put you on the spot to talk through what this means and how, how it works for the teacher day and how it fits within the teacher elementary teacher's contract? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so with a start time, a teacher start time of 725, um, that gives them just a little bit of buffer in the morning uh, before students start to uh, get off the buses. And then uh, the idea is that they're essentially with their students um, right up until dismissal time, with a couple of exceptions. They have a 30-minute uh, duty-free lunch period built in there. 
And um, they also have at least a 30 minute special area class. Uh, well, their students have a 30 minute special area class that they're not required to attend, which uh, starts their uh, planning time for the day. Um, so our elementary teachers, well, teachers get 110 minutes of planning time um, during the course of a day. Well, four days a week, except for our meeting day um, when it's 50 minutes. Um, so to get to that 110 minutes, we have that 30 minute special area class during the course of the day. Um, and then they would have the bulk of their time after student dismissal. So if students um, leave the building at 150, then they have an hour and 20 minutes of planning time after school, uh, which combined with that 30 minute um, special area class that they don't, that their students go to um, gives them their 110 minutes of planning time during those four days. Um, one day a week we do have uh, is a designated meeting day right now that's Wednesday where we have our staff meetings or curriculum meetings so they get 50 minutes of planning time then so we have to provide for that 30 minute of uh, planning time during the course of the day and then an additional 20 minutes after school. Um, but then the rest of that time is uh, designated to uh, staff meetings. Thanks, Alan. And um, well, there's some questions in the thought exchange about, well, what happens with students between 730 and 745? Is that 15 minute arrangement different than what we have now or different from what we had pre pandemic? Uh, it's no different from what we have now or what we had pre pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had a, a drop time of 7.45, so we started to unload the buses at 7.45, and parents uh, would start to drop off their students at 7.45, um, and they make their way down to the classrooms, and they unpack, and they go into their classrooms and uh, put their things away, hand in their homework and such. Uh, but then the official start of the day pre-pandemic was then 8 o'clock, so with, there was about a 15-minute uh, there was a 15 minute period of time to allow that transition into the building. And then at eight o'clock, if students were just coming to the building at eight o'clock, they were considered tardy. Um, the same holds true this year, though we have the two split times. Our primary students are dropped off right now at 730 with a start time of 745. And our uh, third and fourth grade students are dropped off at 815 with official start time of 830. Um, so this proposed um, schedule for next year really is no different from what we've traditionally or historically had. We have a, a drop time and then about a 15 minute buffer to allow students to offload off the buses for parents to drop them off and for them to get into the classroom before the official start of the school day. And Alan, how, how did it go, the 730 start for those K2 children? Uh, Really, it was not an issue. Our, our uh, primary students come in uh, bubbling with energy each and every day, probably more so than than I do, uh, certainly. Uh, but there has not really been any sort of instructional impact with starting the day at that time. It's it's really just 15 minutes earlier for our students, and and it has been a non-issue. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alan. Um, Mr. Laster, I'm going to have you uh, take a look at the next slide. This is um, a slide that uh, includes the student day at the top and then um, the teacher day. And you shared this with me earlier, and you have a difference between Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday. Can you explain kind of the thinking behind that and, and what you hope that that would accomplish? Sure. Uh, thanks, Dr. Well. So uh, basically, we have we had three activity periods in previous years. We're looking to preserve those three. However, uh, in previous years, we had it on Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday uh, because we had a Wednesday afternoon meeting day. So I, I would propose, and we talked about it at Building Cabinet last week, um, if if we have to go with the schedule at the middle level. Um, I would say let's try to do our activity period three days in a row for consistency purposes for students. So it would be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday activity period. Um, because the buses, uh, because the activity period you can see on the slide ends at 420, the teacher workday, we purposely staggered that 10 minutes. 
uh, because if any of you have ever been to the middle school on a Friday, one of the challenges uh, is the teacher work day and the student end day are at the same time. So it creates a big jam up trying to leave campus. So you can see that with the end times between students and teachers for all of the days, we staggered it by 10 minutes to try to mitigate those problems. Uh, so when you look at Thursday, Friday, uh, I think it's unreasonable to think that we're going to have an hour after school having professional conversations and staff meetings and things like that. So we shifted uh, our uh, meeting time, our professional development time that we have uh, to Thursday mornings and Friday mornings, which will, you can see will allow our staff to get out of here uh, 10 minutes right after the dismissal of students on, uh, on uh, Thursdays and Fridays. So you know, if, if this is the direction in which the district is going, uh, I want to be prepared for it and try to make the best situation for students and staff. So um, the other thing that we are looking at is the amount of time uh, as a district between 745 and potentially 905. So you have a gap. Um, so our community may have a need to have a morning program. So I would be uh, looking to, to put together uh, instead of our come and sit in the cafeteria, have breakfast program, I would like to have students, especially next fall, think about coming and signing up for some, uh, uh, you know, I, I call them for a lack of better words, I was talking to Gloria about it, uh, enrichment, uh, but targeted enrichment, some interventions. Again, uh, we're very concerned about that anticipated learning loss. So if we could put together something in the morning, especially if there's a new community need that emerges, um, we definitely would be interested in talking about that. So. Uh, that's basically uh, where we are in our thinking and planning if we have to go in this direction as a middle level. Barbara and then Blanca. I just had a quick question for Alan. Uh, the after school 80 minute teacher time or planning time, I guess it's called, uh, what happens as in the past, many teachers would have clubs with kids, you know, be in sign language or robotics or whatever, where they, you know, did these after school activities, does that bump into their planning time or are they giving up their planning time to do that? Um, thanks. That's a good question, Barbara. Um, we have had some teachers who've done that, who have volunteered to give up their planning time um, and lead a club. But what's been far more common, at least at GES, and I think at some of the other schools, is that the PTA has stepped in and provided uh, enrichment courses. Uh, we've had several sessions of courses uh, over the last few years that have really been sponsored and run by the PTAs that include those robotics clubs and uh, book clubs and even just Lego building clubs. Um, so they've been great experiences for our students. They've also served as a fundraiser for our PTAs um, and still preserve teaching plan teacher planning time. So uh, we have had some teachers who've led clubs and I would anticipate that that would still happen, but the bulk are from the PTA. Blanca? Uh, my question is for Mr. Lester. Um, are you getting clearly on the thought exchange? We have a lot of strong opinions opposed to the new start time. Is that the case amongst your staff? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I think I get a sense from staff that they're definitely concerned about the uh, the late ending. I don't know how many people know what I just sort of talked about from the slide. Uh, you know, that was something that, you know, came out of our building cabinet. I talked about, I proposed that idea to them last Thursday. Um, you know, so as this conversation continues, um, you know, I think that uh, the feedback I'm getting is people are, you know, want us to make sure we examine all of the impact on the middle level learner um, and whether or not the 50 minute gain at the high school level is worth the 20 minute um, uh, adjustment back to the middle level. And that's basically the, the sort of uh, conversation. So. Okay, thank you. Then my other question, sorry, Marie, I'm, I'm, stealing, okay. I'm stealing another opportunity. Um, has, has any thought been given to shortening the day or will that make things like a whole bunch worse because it, it'll be more complicated? It just seems to me, and, and again, um, this is my personal experience that 
that seems like one heck of a long day, especially for the kids that are transitioning from elementary school into middle school. It, it felt really long to me. It felt even worse when the daylight would get shorter. And then when my kids started playing varsity tennis, so one of our parents wrote in the thought exchange that it's it's basically madness at night when you're trying to get dinner on the table, do the homework, and the kids are coming home late from from um, you know practice or games. So I just want to put that out there. Has any thought been given to that? Well, it's funny that you should yeah. mention that, Blanca. So I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here, but um, I actually looked at the analysis of the numbers of hours of instruction at the middle school and. Um, Secondary schools need to have 990 hours of instruction in a year for state aid purposes. And the middle school is 90 hours over that, 1,080 hours, uh, which is a lot. So here, here is the challenge. I think it, you know, I say it would be relatively easy, but I'm, I, I can feel how people, no, it's not easy. Uh, I do think it would be relatively easy to um, find 20 minutes to make the middle school 20 minutes shorter, but all roads lead to transportation. The only way to do that is to make a, a similar reduction in the number of hours at the high school, which has more than needed in its hours, but not as much. So then the conversation has to circulate around to would we be willing to uh, reduce certain minutes per block at the high school in order to shorten the um, middle school day so that the buses can get between those buildings in a reasonable amount of time. And I, I think it is 100% worth the conversation. Even if we weren't looking at this, um, 1,080 hours is a lot. Yeah, to, to echo Dr. Wiles, I mean, we had a conversation about this today. The only concern that I would have about get, gaining the full 20 minutes is when you think about our master schedules at the secondary level, our, our some of our um, lab-based classes like music, um, they're already 40 minutes. Um, if you start chipping away at the minutes of those, some of those instructional periods. Uh, we're then talking maybe only 35. I just, we just have to be careful talking about how many minutes we're talking off the instructional day because I would not want to impact program and instructional program on kids. So I do think we have some flexibility with the analysis of the minutes, but I would be really nervous about doing the full 20 minutes because that would make our our skinnies, like 35 minutes, 32 minutes, something like that. I think Gloria, then Blanca. Well, I'm encouraged to hear uh, at least some thinking uh, beyond, you know, what we see on the paper. Uh, um, you know, Blanca asked, I'm, and I know Mike has heard from people, and I have heard from people, who, former teachers, as you heard from Nancy Condolan today, and teachers who are today teaching at middle level. Um, there are a lot of disadvantages to this late this lateness. Uh, I mean, the, the effect on family life alone, uh, having lived this schedule myself with kids, uh, but it was 20 minutes shorter and I was pulling my hair out. I mean, kids are eating in the car, heading to religious ed or going here or there. You're trying to get dinner in them, forget family life, forget sitting around and having dinner during the week. That, that just doesn't happen. Trying to get to a doctor's appointment, impossible. So you end up taking the kids out of school during the day um, kids don't want to stay activity period because it's so darn late and the late buses are way late getting home. So you, there, there are a lot of disadvantages to this late day and it's been this way for so long and pushing it 20 minutes more just exacerbates the whole thing. So I'm, I'm encouraged to hear some, some thought. I, I, I respect your, your thinking, uh, Mike, about, you know, the skinnies and all, but I think we need to be creative and we need to think about what's best for this age group as well. As we're thinking about the high school, we're making some you know, tremendous changes there, and I respect that. We think about our elementary school, but let's not forget those kids in the middle. Uh, they, they deserve uh, the same kind of thinking and effort that we've put. Blanca and then Seema. 
Yeah, jumping off of Mike and Gloria's points. Um, so while we're thinking about what could be um, detrimental in terms of taking away minutes from certain classes, I would also be fearful as a parent if I didn't bring up the point that I already feel like there's a lot of homework. And if shortening the day will somehow mean that there's more homework expect or expectations of more homework or busy work in the evening, that um, would also be bad. So I just think we need to be cognizant of both, that we're not gonna be like trying to fix one problem and then creating another one. It is, it is hard to be the parent of a middle schooler and it is, it is, uh, it doesn't help that it's dark to top it off. It's dark when the kids get on the bus and it's dark when they're coming home. It's really difficult. Um, so that was one point. Then I just wanna add, um, I am, I am pro having adolescents start later. I, I've seen the same research that Dr. B presented and I, and I, I believe in it, but I am also very concerned with the middle school start time. I just don't know that it's feasible. We don't live in a perfect world, I think, where we could have the kids starting at 10 or, or whatnot. It, it's just not gonna work. I'm more comfortable with the high school start time, but I also agree with most of the community that the, the middle school start time might need some work. So. Seema, and then Gloria, is your hand up again? Okay, Seema. Um, my question is, I guess, you know, a lot of people wrote in about the middle school start time. They did the thought exchange um, at PTA council. Um, I heard that it was middle school teachers were not happy with the late start time, but also high school teachers um, also not happy with the late end time. So I know that there's always, it's not gonna be perfect for anybody, but knowing that we, it's already uncertain next year, just like we talked about before with um, just uncertainty in general with the school year, why I don't, you know, I don't know why we'd add in another factor of like this time change that you know, a lot of people are not in favor of. And I understand, you know, starting early is also not ideal, but there's, I hear pushback too from the ending late in the high school level too. So now we have middle school and high school, school uh, both of those buildings upset about the late end time, late end time, right? Um, so I don't know if that's something that, you know, is that like, do, do we need to throw a wrench into the time, uh, start time and end time in addition to all the other um, uncertainty that we talked about before, which is why we're not making other changes? I think um, I'm going to transition to Mike here in a minute. I, I just would say that if we could go back to our old times, um, and then if we wanted to make a time change the year after, that would be four consecutive years with different start times, 2019, no, 20, 2019, 2020, then this year, then next year, and then the following year. Um, that's a lot of transitions for transportation to do four separate times. Um, but, you know, it's it's a reasonable comment. Let me um, flash ahead here to the high school um, and let Mike talk about what you guys are thinking about there. Um, let me let me start like we are we're like everybody else. We're kind of uh, working within the uh, model of the transportation drop off and pick up times. So as you're looking at this. Um, block one um, and block four. So you see block one starts at 820. So we're talking about, you know, um, 815 uh, drop off from the buses. They're going directly to block one. We, this is what our schedule currently looks like. This is maintaining an 84 minute schedule. Um, the buses get back to the high school and depart by 320. And then we've got the activity period. Um, so if we leave our activity period at the end of the day, um, the, the students would be able to stay until four o'clock and then we'd have late buses going at 405. Now, I give Mike Laster a lot of credit for this. Mike was, when Mike was suggesting uh, the idea of doing the after school activity period three days a week and then switching it to the morning for two days a week, we were debating this in cabinet, building cabinet as well. Um, we talked about the idea of moving the activity period to entirely in the beginning of the day. So all five days, it would be 738 to 820. 
Um, but during our discussion, people were bringing out, well, it's hard to do that and give up uh, the opportunity for extra help for students if, if because students are a lot less likely to get extra help before school than they would be after school. And I think it's a very valid point. So this seems like a pretty um, decent compromise of maintaining the activity period after school three days a week and then shifting it to before school or Thursday and Friday where we can do our meetings on Thursday and collaboration on a Friday. So, so but we're still, you know, as probably every other level is, we are still talking about variations of this and how we can maximize the time. Um, and again, Marie, I don't know if you want me to bring up the, the, the remediation period we we're trying to explore in the middle of the day too. Um, sure, there's an idea floating around. It's worth um, sharing. Yeah, we've been exploring just an idea in cabinet to see what people think about it. And um, we're not sure if we can do it, but it's about creating uh, a remediation period during the school day. It does mean we have to shift the times a little bit to make it work. Shift, it means we would, we would have to look at a shorter instructional block and shorter passing times. Um, but we're exploring that idea of trying to create like a 30 minute um, period during the day where students could get help from teachers. Sina? Um, I don't know if it just impacts the high school, but are there programs that are um, like from BOCES and CTE that are impacted by middle school and high school start times or just high school? Are, are they impacted at all? We've been looking closely at the CTE times. Um, so a typical, uh, a morning CTE program goes from eight o'clock until 1030. So if you look at our bell times, what that does is that means uh, a student who's going to BOCES for their, their morning program would be returning and would take two classes in block three and four. So they would come back around 11 o'clock and they, we would have to house them in a study hall for a half hour before they start their afternoon classes. Um, for their morning bus run, we'd have to figure that out with transportation because we would have to, we'd have to figure out a way to do bus runs that would bring them directly from their house to the CTE programs. In the afternoon, the afternoon has always been a challenge for us because those programs go from 11 o'clock to 1.30. And if you look at our schedule, that would mean they'd be leaving block two right in the middle of block two and coming back right um, in the middle, like the beginning of block four. What we would have to do is, and actually this is a positive change for those students, we would plan their GHS classes a little bit differently. We would have them take a block one class and a block four class. So they would take a GHS class, leave for CT, come back, and they would come back pretty close to the start of our block four class. They miss a little bit of time, but we would be able to work with that. It's actually better than it is now. I, I apologize. I forgot to ask too. Um, advanced classes in eighth grade that meet before school starts would that still happen? Or yeah. So so uh, in addition to we have studio art that we would still offer. We would still have all of our enri enrichment offerings. Like I said, if a new need emerges in the community where we want to expand some of those enrichment offerings so that kids could sign up for that, I think that we could definitely do that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, that's basically sort of, you asked about the impact um, on the middle level. Uh, we don't have the same situation as high school, but, um, you know, the impact is minimal, Seema, in terms of uh, your, your question before, so. Thank you. Um, I just think that since we've gotten so many comments about the start times that I wonder, is there a way to have like a separate vote or somehow detach that from the budget itself? Because I'm yeah, afraid so it's going to hold it up. Yes, you there. there is no cost um, proposal associated with this. Um, it 
it was a function of when were we meeting and when did we want to have the conversation. However, if there is going to be a, well, transportation will need to know what they're doing in the fall in May. So the board needs to make a decision on what to be, what to include in the budget on April 13th. But this piece can be held off for a little bit of time. Does, Barbara? Do we need to make a motion to do that? <laughs> How does that work? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to point out is this, the fear of the unknown. Remember, one of the concerns that we had when we were talking about changing start times was the earlier start time for our younger students. And because we were forced to do that this year, um, what Alan and all the other um, principals have told us is that, you know, the kids were bright and ready to learn and there was no impact on their ability to learn or behavior or whatever. And I think the same thing probably will apply at, at the high school and the middle school level. Anytime there's a change, um, you know, people fear change. And yet all the data that we have, um, including one that I think I disseminated to the board the other day, just indicates that it is the best thing for kids. And all these fears that are out there really once the thing is implemented um there's a whole change in attitude in a positive way so i would just encourage you know what you're what you folks are doing about potentially uh helping the middle school situation um you know by shaving off a few minutes you know in each period or whatever grand solutions you come up with but um I just think, I think what Marie points out that if you just keep changing times, you know, four years in a row, um, I don't think that's good for kids. And the middle school kids uh, certainly will benefit when they move up to the high school. And, and that has just been proven by one scientific study after another. So I, I just would hope that uh, with all the innovations that you folks seemingly are coming up with that, you know, we will continue with this. Thanks. Rebecca? Um, I just wanted to echo very similarly to what Barb just said. I really like commend you for coming up with the creative solutions in response to the thought exchange that you just presented for the middle school and the high school. Um, you know, the high school, and I'm gonna get the times a little bit off, currently starts at I think 10.15 or 10.20. If we were to go back to 2019 time, that's a three hour difference. I mean, that that is a stark difference if we were to go back to what where it was, where it was. Um, and the health benefits really have been borne out, as Barb said, in multiple, multiple studies. So I really love the creativity into making it work better for students across the district, but I would not really be in support of um, going back to what it was. Gloria? I, I don't think the middle school thing is the thing about, is it what Barbara said about fear, I have to disagree there. We're, we're moving in a negative direction by extending the day later. That's clear. I mean, we've already been in this late mode for years and we know it has, it has problems. And so now what we're doing is we're just moving it even worse. So I don't think we're gaining anything with the middle school time with the, with the change by pushing it forward. So I think that is an issue and that's gonna be a problem. I have no problem with change. It's not a matter of fear. It's just that it has not worked well before and it's certainly not going to work if we increase it and push it further in the day i think the biggest the biggest drawback is what it does to kids family life and what it does to family life in general and the stress on kids blanca so i think what we're what i'm hearing though is that at the very least we need to have more discussion about it and i don't know if there's an opportunity to have a thought exchange devoted just to this, or if there's ever an opportunity to have families vote on this, members of the community, but it is, it's gonna be life-changing for some folks. And we can make all the changes we want in the world to the school schedule, but you know, work schedules, we have no control over. So we could be trying to do something really good for kids and then making it really more difficult on parents and family life, which could then in turn make it worse for the children. I, I'm just putting that out there. I think what I'm hearing though, is that there's a lot of great points out there. 
a lot of great data and we just need more time to talk about it. And we also have to respect the members of the community that have um, voiced their concerns and our teachers as well. That's what I think. So just a, a point of um, information, the task force is going to get back together. Um, I'll share all the feedback with them and um, encourage them to do some brainstorming. Um, I just want to point out, um, and maybe it's obvious to everyone, but I, I do want to give a shout out to the task force um, because this has been a, a ton of work. Um, the option that you've seen before you is the 18th variation that they looked at. So uh, we did research. I shared some of that last week. Uh, Damien led a subcommittee that looked at seven options. We brought in a school bus consultant organization who gave us five more. We threw all those out because they had issues. They gave us five more, that's 17. And then this one is number 18. So um, just for what it's worth, I don't want anyone to think that we hastily arrived at a plan that was not um, really worked over a, a million different ways. And there were a couple things in the thought exchange that wouldn't it just be easy to flip the middle school and the elementary school times. And that came up in a, a variety of ways. And I, I just wanna mention that I, I, I talked with Danielle Poirier about that very thing. And um, there's a few reasons why we can't do it from a transportation perspective. Um, in the morning, when we do our elementary runs, those runs are confined to neighborhoods. So they take a lot less time to pick up the kids within the catchment areas and, and, and uh, drop students off at their neighborhood school. To do the middle school run first would take much, much longer. So we would either have to start them much earlier or we'd have to push the start of the high school even later which would push the start of the elementary well after nine o'clock. And now we're creating widespread childcare needs for very young children. So um, while on paper, it may look like it makes a lot of sense, um, it's, it's really not a feasible solution for, again, our geography. If, if we were all on one campus, it might work, but we're not. So, um, I, I just wanted to say that because that had come up three or four times in the thought exchange. So at, at this point, I know we've been working here for a while. Um, and so I guess I wanna just open it up for any other comments, questions, thoughts um, on any of the topics. And we did not get to all of the thought exchange questions I had uh, good intentions, community, if you're listening. I had many of them highlighted, hoping to cover a lot of territory. I think we did cover a lot of territory, but we didn't get to everything. For that, I apologize. I'd like to just comment um, to wrap up the discussion about start times. Uh, I think that was a great discussion that we just had. Uh, clearly, it's very complex. There's a lot of different aspects of the issue. I really believe that if we're going to do it, this is the, this is the year to do it. Uh, it's a great time to start fresh. Uh, to me, it seems like the biggest concerns uh, from that is the ending time. So uh, Marie mentioned that we could consider shortening the school day. I think that's a really good idea and we should definitely consider it, right? If we're going to, you know, uh, go by the studies that have been presented, the students are going to be uh, more eager to learn. They're going to be able to learn better during the school day because of the later start time. So starting the classes by maybe just a couple minutes each shouldn't have a profound impact, right? Uh, and it will, you know, even if we can shave 20 minutes off the day, I think that would alleviate many of the issues that were brought up. So I just wanted to throw that out there for consideration. Ben? Ben, we, we can't hear you.
Um, we, we continue to carry TA unassigned. Um, Neil, do you happen to know the number off the top of your head? I want to say six, perhaps five. Um, it would be the same number as last year. We scaled it back a little bit last year. So um, I think it's around five, if I remember correctly. Luciano, is that your hand again? No worries. No, it wasn't. Sorry, I did it from last time. So um, just a quick thing about next steps. Uh, we don't meet again until the 13th. Um, between now and then, in theory, we will have a state budget um, with some updates then to the worksheet that Neil shared for today. Um, and uh, I would assume we would um, continue with questions, answers, and whatever updates we might have at that point. The uh, task force is meeting after the 13th, so perhaps it would make some sense that we focus mostly on our the budget related topics and if i have any updates around tasks task force i can share them but that they won't meet until the couple days after that all right i want to just thank everyone who participated in our thought exchange um and certainly to our board members with your great questions and um you know i think this was a really good conversation tonight so seema i'll turn it back to you if we don't have any other comments or questions, can I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Blanca, second Rebecca, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 9-0. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank have you, everyone. Night.